Welcome, everyone, to another live taping of Afikra Outline. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today, joining us is Nadia Kaabe Linke, who is a visual artist and curator. Uh, Nadia was born in Tunisia and grew up between Tunis, Kiev, and Dubai. She graduated from the University of Fine Arts in Tunis in 99 and earned a PhD from the Sorbonne in 2008. Today we're discussing three, uh, discussing the process between, behind three of her works, Flying Carpets, Smell, and Das Capital uh, Epilogue. Nadia, welcome to Outline. Hello, very happy to be joining you. Um, I guess the first question is, how and where are you? Uh, I'm well. And the second question, I am in Berlin, in my studio right now. Okay, so how long, as somebody who has been sort of born and raised uh, all over the world and has a very sort of global uh, perspective, how long have you been based in Berlin? Uh, I came here, I visited the first time, it was in 2004, and I moved to Berlin in 2006. I'm here since 2006. Mm. Okay. Um, well, I want to come back to that in a second. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, growing up between Tunis, Kiev, and Dubai. Um, those are three very different places. Um, do you feel like when you reflect on your childhood that these are very different phases during which you developed a very different perspective? Uh, well, um, maybe I'll surprise you. I didn't feel such a huge difference between uh, Tunisia and Ukraine. Uh, probably because I really did grow up between like the two languages, the two cultures. It was for me the most natural thing to be both because uh, the, my parents' friends were Russian speaking coming from the former Soviet Union, like mixed couples like themselves. And um, so all of this, let's say, Sovietic, uh, communist, socialist world were just, was just part of our life. And when I used to travel, um, to spend most of the summer holidays, so like three months every year, um, it was like a continuation, right? It was just maybe um, the buildings that were different, the plants and everything, but the language and the culture is part of myself. The real big difference for me was going to the Emirates, was the emigration, because it was really like five years of my life and probably 15 or 20 years of my father's life. So that was like really a cut, a very harsh cut, and where I had to position myself, where I was very lost for a long period of time. Because there was also this mirroring from the outside. My dialect was not really understood from the school, the people in the school, because most of the children were coming from the Middle East and they were not North Africans. They didn't even know what Tunisia is. It was like an alien place. And I was even told that my language is not Arabic, and that even the teacher, a member of uh, Islamic education, she had a problem with Bourguiba and what Tunisia uh, embodied as like a modern country that did not apply Sharia and everything. She was like, oh, oh, you're not real Muslim. So, you know, when you're 12 years old and you're told that your Arabic is not Arabic and you're not Muslim, you're like, OK. So that was like more a cultural shock for me. And also in the 90s, the Emirates were completely different of what they are today. Um, there was little things for little girls to do. Um, now it is really yeah. a fascinating place for everyone. You can develop so many creative directions and things and a dream place probably for children. But back in uh, 1990, when I came, it was also the beginning of the Gulf War. That was quite a tough time to situate yourself as the beginning of your adolescence, yeah. So Tunisia and Ukraine was really the most natural thing to be between both. And the Emirates, by the end, I loved it and it became my home. And when I go to the Emirates, it's like completely a place that uh, I identify with, um, mm. with its good and bad. But it's really because a very important part of my life and my childhood and my youth happened there. So I would even say that like my personality through the difficulties and the misunderstandings, it has built much of who I am today. Yeah, because um, it's funny, I always, I always uh, pay attention to how people's, what people's bios look like, how they're constructed, and almost the hierarchy of somebody's bio. I always pay attention to this type of stuff because I think it's like a, a, 
unconscious re- uh, reveal of somebody's own internal values. And it's always interesting to me that as, as I've sort of looked, um, I researched your work, there's always this framing of, you know, Nadia grew up here, here, and here, and here, right? And yeah. that you've been sort of pulled in, in these different ways. Yeah. As you've gotten further into your career um, and have become situated in a, in, a, in a place of your own choosing, um, do you feel like that perspective and that effect of your uh, child childhood has sort of receded in the background and it's you don't always think about oh yes I did grow up in these different places with these different perspectives and no no it's uh, absolutely not it's really part of my uh, who I am and uh, often I'm even asked this question about the identity and I always answer that for me identity is something very open it's a process so I cannot name it because in the moment where I name it I say whatever Arab Muslim Christian Orthodox uh, Ukraine I I named it and then I killed all the other possibilities and also because something that is moving as long as long I have new identities that I have ad- added up to myself, being a mother, a conceptual artist, I mean, so many other things, living between contingencies. Now there's the addition of the war. So it, it brings a part of who you become, you know, because war is not something far away. It's now my home. It's also, you know, definitely I changed also in that sense and I am changing. So my childhood is going, it's my roots, it's always there, but it's, it's evolving to something else. And there's so many misunderstandings, you know, misjudgments that I suffered a lot from when I was a child because I look very different from what one would expect from an Arab girl because of my physics, you know, I'm more yeah. European looking. And paradoxically, again, I suffered from that because I was stigmatized in the school as the non-Arab girl, as the... I used to be called names like Kefra. It's very negative in Arabic when you come from a Muslim background. Your mom is not Muslim, so you know. And really strangely enough, my son today in Germany is going through the same shift. Sorry for the word, if I can say it. He's blonde, but he goes goes to school to in Kreuzberg. It's a very mixed school. You have so many Turks and Arabs, and I was happy about that actually. And he says, I am African. This is my background. My mom comes from Africa. I have Arabic roots. And he's actually mobbed from children who come from Islamic uh, background because, again, he doesn't look like that and he doesn't speak the language. So it's like repeating this wow. thing of being rejected. And I am an adult now and I went through all of this rejecting part and I embraced it and thought maybe it's a chance so that I don't, I don't have to stick to a country. I don't have to stick to an identity. I can be all of it. So it gave me yeah. a kind of freedom. This idea of being always rejected in any place I go made me, gave, made me strength, gave me strength. But it really hurts me, pains me to see how my son is suffering the same thing all over again. So this thing yeah. is not killing us, actually. Yeah. It's very well, much. He will have an internal strength as well, I suppose. It gives you strength. Um, I, the strength, I think, comes from dramas and problems. <laughs> well, who said that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, something happens you don't die from it you survive it then it makes you stronger i think Nietzsche. yeah like yeah, yeah what doesn't kill you makes you stronger it's how it doesn't kill you makes you stronger yeah yeah i used to be i used to be a school teacher and i always and i was a school teacher in a very 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 uh tough school and i i used to joke because people will used to say oh you know mikey what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and i used to say yeah but there's a second half to that sentence what kills you actually kills you <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're done. <laughs> like, like, I, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. Um, let's, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, these three projects. So for those people who are new to this series, Outline is a series that's focused on process. Um, oftentimes we have guests on the series or guests who are featured in conversations on other platforms. And it's always this idea of like, oh, you start a project and all of a sudden it's done and it's beautiful and it's award-winning and it's all these different things and there's no process behind it, um, which is obviously not true. So we try to create space on the outline series to talk about process specifically. And Nadia, if you remember that when I reached out to you originally, we were trying to figure out which projects would be best suited to have this conversation. And we chose three of them. Um, And so one of them was flying carpets uh, which we'll talk about in a second. The other one is Das Capital and Das Capital Epilogue. And then we also chose Smell as conversations about 
as subjects for this conversation. So if you would, um, can you just give us a sort of a brief description of these three different projects? Um, what, if you were to explain it to like a 15 year old cousin or nephew or uh, niece, what is, what is Flying Carpets about? Well, first of all, I would like to say that it's really very difficult. The choice was difficult because I think most of my work is very much process-based. Um, and I, I enjoy as much going through all of the steps and the unknowns and the problems also that I encountered during the, this journey as much as the final uh, result. So yeah, we have selected these, um, but we could have spoken about any others and yeah, it would, be as, would have been as relevant. So for flying carpets, uh, well, it is what it says from the title, first of all, it brings us to this imaginary fairy tale, um, dream world of uh, Elf Leila or Leila, so uh, Thousand and One Night uh, of the Flying Carpets. So first of all, the idea is that when you travel with the flying carpet, there are no boundaries anymore. You have to be just kind to the carpet that it doesn't throw you out. <laughs> That's the only deal. <laughs> yeah. Rather, and actually the world is yours and it's really, and it is also how I feel it is. So the boundaries and the frontiers, it is very artificial and we forget that it is a recent phenomenon. It came after the, um, the break of the old empires. So before the Second World War, there were empires and it, the, the, uh, uh, the borders were uh, permeable. They, you, you could move from one place to the other. And you often had people speaking very different languages in different capitals. So because it was empires, in the sense it was meant to embrace and give a place for all these different uh, minorities, cultures, religions and everything. So I'm not saying it's a good time, the empires. Now I am as a Ukrainian tasting what it means today. Uh, I'm just saying that it is a recent phenomenon. The borders, as we know them, this uh, frontier and you need the visas and all. Coming from the Arab world, um, I did struggle a lot. Uh, had for very, most of the, my life a Tunisian passport. So it was really even to go for an artist talk or things like that. Sometimes it was not possible, uh, etc. So the idea of the flying carpets come from that right, actually. I think our birthright to embrace our, our mother earth. It belongs to all of us. It's just cultural. The separation is only um, a cultural thing. So, um, yeah, that's if we go to the title. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay, we'll, we'll dive into we'll, we'll we'll dive into the details in a second. But if you give us a little uh, brief on Das Kapital epilogue, yeah. So again, Das Kapital uh, epilogue. It, the title t tells a lot of what it is. Um, so it is the end of. I felt like we, uh, with the beginning of the Corona, we were embracing somehow that it's like a new era. Uh, with an altering of the idea of the capitalism or even the post-capital capital social uh, uh, society. But the project, ironically enough or strangely enough, I don't know, it just uh, came about just before uh, the lockdowns and just before we knew even that there, were, there was the coronavirus. It's this very interesting coincidence or let's say time in space that brought things together. Um, yeah. So we'll get later a bit into the detail. It is about yeah. an, an urban uh, legend that I discovered while uh, walking in the center of Amman and yeah. inspired the whole uh, video and installation. Yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah, the it's, a, it's a really fun story. So I'm excited to. Yeah, to yeah, there was a, yeah, a funny one. <laughs> so, and then the last one is smell. Yeah. So uh, smell also, again, it tells what uh, it's about. It's about smelling the flowers of jasmine and uh, the lack of the smell. So when it starts to dry, there is no smell and the colors of uh, the, the jasmine becomes dark brown. And so it mixes with the dark background. And uh, so it's also about going from one phase to the other, the transformation. The work itself is, pro is a process. And here also what, why I chose it, because there was a very unexpected anecdote that would speak about it, something that happened. Um, so it's a work about Salafism, and at the end, it's a Salafist who saved the piece. So, yeah. Cool. 
Okay, so we split these interviews into three parts, before, during, and after. Um, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And I think it, what makes sense is for you to choose any one of the projects that actually is relevant to the to the question that you might uh, might actually make sense. So um, the first question we'd like to start with is, what were you doing before you started the project? So maybe we can talk about any any one of them. Like whenever you start projects like this, is there a sort of a before and after? Are you doing something entirely different and then you get pulled into the center of Amman and you're like, oh my God, I have to do this. Like how do these projects originate? Well, actually everything I have and happened in my life is not really planned. So uh, I can pick everyone separately. It's always an event or something that triggers. I am so fully embedded in life and I am inspired from life that this is just a process. It occurs and I follow things that happen to me. So, for example, with the flying carpets, which is when I visited for the first time the Venice Biennale, it was 2009. Uh, while I was working, walking in the streets between the most touristic part, which is San Marco, and going towards the Giardini, where the Biennale is, I attended how the police was just uh, following, uh, persecuting the street peddlers, and how everything in one second just changed. All of the calm and super, like, they were almost invisible, no one really looked at them, and then there was, like, this threatening situation that we all experienced. So I carried that moment with me to Berlin, and then slowly things evolved from there. Uh, the second one is uh, the Amman work. Actually, I, I was invited for a residency um, at an amazing place that I love, Darat al Funun. Um, yeah, of course. <laughs> It's like an extended family place now. And so I was invited, it was the first time in my life in Amman, and I was invited to yeah, just let the city um, work on me and see what comes out of that experience. And every time I love working in different places, but I'm always super respectful and, you know, like I'm not from there. I, I, I don't want to do things that probably will... Uh, would provoke something negative and like how can you criticize and I want to be always somehow respectful to the place where I am so I really start just from looking listening following what the people tell me more than my judgment on things yeah like as if so, I off I turn off that part of my well, it's, judging it's so interesting hearing you say that because I feel like that must be informed by your childhood this idea of like maybe as a child even as a child, you're like, I don't know if I have a place here, right? I'm being, I'm being told that I don't have a place. I'm being told I don't have a, a place in my own culture, my own language, my own religion, my own place. I'm, I'm being told that I'm an outsider and that yeah. I need to tread lightly. And so now <laughs> you are so cognizant of that fact that when you're walking through the streets of Amman and speaking to some woman about her house, right? Um, you're like, I am an outsider here. I need to walk in with respect, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of that, yeah. But I, I like also what you're saying. We were looking at the cartoon with my son when he was little, and there was this expression that someone said, I, I don't fit in, I fit out. That's, I fit yeah. out. I fit out. This is my yeah. play. And now I, I used to suffer from it, but I think it brought so many positive things, actually, into my life. Yeah. So um, having a walk, I discovered, I didn't talk to the woman herself, actually I never met her, but I was in the old uh, part of the city, which is a very popular one, uh, above yeah. it you have Al'a and all of this uh, historical area, yeah. and down you have kind of a suburb, it's not bidonville, it's not really poor, but a bit popular, let's say, and there was a place that it, there was like a kind of a hole, an empty space within a very uh, full place with different buildings and everything, so it already drew my attention, and I started to ask what happened, and this is where the anecdote, the urban legend came from, yeah. and again, with me to Berlin because it was a two-phase uh, residency and I forgot to say that actually I am a collective working with my husband very closely together his team uh, name is Timo Kabi Linke he also took my name and I took his so we're not brothers oh. we just took each other's names and uh, I told him the story and we started from there and I'll cool. tell you I mean we'll get back to the photo because I showed him the photo of the place and that's where I was like wow there was yeah. a wow yeah well, let's actually uh, talk about that, because I love talking about this idea of when did a... Uh, I, I want to, but all of them have an interesting past. The smell is, there was just the revolution that happened in Tunisia. So the work, I did it in 2012. 
And mm -hmm. so 2017 is, is wrong. It's 2012. It's wrong, yeah. No, yeah. no, it's no problem. Uh, and the revolution happened during 2000, starting in 2010 and really happened in 2011. And there was all of this hope, time, and beautiful one year, like really incredible. It's a blessed to have been in Tunis in that period of time. Completely magical with the solidarity of the people. The police just left. We, we had the feeling that the country is working just because the people were doing it themselves, not the institutions. Uh, but then there started the moment when the violence, the religious violence came. And one of the people who were, uh, of course, the leftists and uh, intellectuals, etc., were beat up. That was the first violent action. And already it started to build like this kind of Salafist. There was Nahda, of course, the uh, Brotherhood, Akhwan uh, Muslimin behind, but also movement of Salafists behind with, who came with their jihadist, violent um, rhetoric and actions. So that's the event that triggered this piece. Yeah. We'll talk about it also later. Hmm. So um, let's... Maybe let's use Das Kapital, for example, for a second. Um, so, you know, you're walking through Amman, you see this, uh, this empty plot in a very crowded, uh, you know, Al-Balad is very, very crowded. You see this empty plot, um, you start asking around. Immediately, do you know, oh, this is turning into a project, for sure. Call us. Not, I, at, all. Not at yeah, all. So. That came, like, really maybe uh, two months later. No, no, I just went with my pure childish open curiosity uh, and not knowing even if I would be having work from Muhammad because you never know if this works, it doesn't work. You cannot premeditate it, right? Often it works for me, um, but it, I know that it doesn't have to, actually. So it's yeah. always like... Uh, and then, yeah, we started to ask around. I was with uh, uh, Muhammad Shakhtish. He's from the... Um, the residency working there and we were very closely collaborating actually for this project so uh, he speaks like the local language it's very important because i have my dialect again so that people feel yeah. comfortable and open up you know even if you're an arab whatever how you look but you have to speak the local you know then people feel more confident so he that was a great help uh doing this tour with him so making locks long story short uh there were several um versions of the same story. But the main story was that the owner of this building, supposedly a woman, some people say it's a family, many people, very rich people from uh, Amman. She had a dream that her dad told her uh, that he found a ring and a treasure under the house. So she believed the dream and she decided that there is a treasure and talking to the neighbors, they're like all saying, we in our subconscious have this hope that we will all get to some kind of treasure because it is the historical area where you have all of these layers. So you have the Roman that were there, uh, all of the um Umayyad, uh, and all of these layers of wealthy empires. And everyone has some ruins actually in the basement of their homes. So this is something there in their minds. So she thought that definitely there was a, a treasure and she decided to just destroy the house. And there, it was many like store building and she was renting. So there are many people who had to leave their home that she had to take an, uh, um, uh, an authorization, like an official paper to do that. And some people told me why they were destroying. They were literally the army, like people, very official situation that didn't let people come in or out. And yeah, so they digged and apparently they didn't find anything. The thing is that once she, she went, uh, she destroyed everything and they wanted to rebuild, they couldn't. Because according to the new laws, you have to have a certain distance between the houses versus when it was built before these laws didn't, didn't exist. So she didn't get the uh, any treasure and she couldn't rebuild the house. It's just a completely lost, lost situation. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, so this was the anecdote that I took with me and I was really interested about this greediness, this wanting something or, you know, a dream that it's always great to believe in your dreams, but like, how far can you go and the risks and all of this thing, gambling and all of these ideas. And then what was interesting for us, I don't know if you have the image of how the, um, this metallic structure is. The fence. The yeah. Fence. Have, let me see if I have, have it in here. It's because then I will explain where the idea came Yeah, let me see if I have it in here. Hold on. I don't 
think it's in here. Okay, hold on. Keep on talking and then I'll get yeah. it. Okay. So I showed the picture of this fans to Timo and we noticed that this fans is actually, normally what is the, the role of a fans? Bawebe. It is to protect the, outs, the insides from the outside. So it has the role of protection. It is like this strong structure that protects. This fence was just standing in the middle of nothing and was not protecting. It was barely uh, holding itself. It was held by stones, a lot of stones, by an electric cable and by a kind of a wooden uh, uh, branch. So it was extremely precarious. But it was still there protecting something that, you know, it was really about its own self. And we saw in that, that's the image, we saw in that, that the world in which we live, the way how the capitalist structures has built themselves of exploitation, of always producing more, of, you know, ignoring our own needs as humans with our spirituality, meaning our connectedness to the earth, and how we're really, by hurting the earth, we are hurting ourselves and we're seeing tragic effects today but still all of these systems and the governments they are protecting something that is already not holding and we saw in this fence really a metaphor of our life today so what is supposed to protect is protecting itself our regimes and governments who are supposed to protect and defend the right, uh, the needs of their population are only protecting and defending the, their own selves. Be it in whatever capitalist, I mean, in a free democratic world or in uh, uh, like a royal system, whatever, it is repeatedly the same thing. This is the common thing, let's say. So we were like, okay, this is very interesting. We will work on the fence. We will make like a kind of reenactment because the fence itself with its fragility represents this whole, um, uh, let's say, contradictory and uh, almost impossible situation. Voila, there it is. Our impossible situation in which we live in the 21st century. So if you see, it's really like only the stones are holding it. And from one side, you have some quite kind of cable wires. And the other side, you have this uh, um, wooden stick. And so we started again to ask, and why is it there, this mass? It's not representing anything. So some people say they just put it quickly like that to say that no one has the right to go into that private property. Some other told us that actually it is a, a homeless guy who is a bit crazy and he has created a kind of protective home, but there is nothing that, you know, if it trains or anything, there's nothing that is protecting him. But yeah, so like this um, contradictory, impossible, ironic element is what attracted us. So now we can go back to the, voilà, the situation. So what we did actually, we reproduced one-to-one -one that fence. We didn't touch the original one. We brought similar stones. We the electric wire. We tried to reproduce the whole situation with its absurdity. So it was only about this fence, this absurd object alone in the space. And there is a video... Uh, work that is and that is actually the poetic moment when you take them together you fall into poetry because we filmed I don't know if you have some bits but so what we did is really filming around the fans and here is a an, really an amazing anecdote about the process how things happen uh, if mm. you allow me to speak about it's a bit longer yeah please go no no, no go 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 because this yeah. is how things often happen when problems come the first reflex is to reject it. But often there's always a blessing in every problem. I really believe in it. Even the disease has in itself something positive when if you really dig into it deeply and open to the blessings of every situation. So what we had here, we went to film at th that day. Uh, I wanted it to be during the day, of course, to see more details. But the time that we got the steady cam and we got the whole material, it's a bit complex so that you film it really properly well. The moment where everything came, it was already like uh, the sunset, almost dark. And I told Tim in that moment, you know, I'm so disappointed. I don't because the next day it's going to be, it was going to be uh, raining, and we had to finish to cut, and we didn't have time actually. Basically, it was only that moment, and I was already in my complete disappointment. And you know, we're not going to get this done, whatever. And Tim said, No, we're still going to do it. I'm going to do it just as a test. Let's see. 
If it doesn't work, we'll continue tomorrow. So what happened? Because it was dark, there was no difference anymore between the background and the fence itself. It became like a completely abstract situation. You, When you look at the film, you don't know if you are on the moon, if you are on the planet Earth, if you are today or you are a thousand years ago. It became something like almost, I would say, Tarkovsky, quality of Tarkovsky. I'm not saying I did the Tarkovsky. Yeah, like a, it's like it, almost like a collage. Exactly. And you are in a surreal situation. You have some places, Tarkovsky played a lot with the uh, science, uh, scientific, you know, science fiction uh, situations, but anchored in a very old traditional Russian house. You know, he played with all of his yeah. native science fiction. And this quality, it came only because we were forced actually to film. It's as if the whole universe tells you now you have to do it. So I'm, I feel like I'm always helped. I want to do a stupid thing and then, you know, there's someone, angels or universe or God or whatever puts me in the right track. So I'm yeah. really emo also with his intuition. He filmed at that moment. And then it became this beautiful, poetic, non-place because the story of also of this woman, it is anchored in the place, but actually could put it in any culture in the world. It's not specific. Yeah. But, you know, it is about our time. It's something that's telling us something about uh, the, the absurdity of our time. And uh, so what happened, we filmed, went all around the fence. And then when you turn, you make the whole turn, you see the, um, the barber. And this is one of the places where we did. So we did all what you hear is the sound of the interviews, all the people that we heard. So it is as if it is a sound sculpture. You are turning around the fence and at the same time you have all the different perspective of the people living there. The speak it's saying the same thing but with slight differences. And the last one is the voice of the people that you are hearing but you don't see them, it's the halaq. So it's the, the barber, the people who are... Yeah. And then, as if, and then you see the reality. Then you see cars. Then you see light. Then you see shop. Then you are you came back on the earth in Amman. You know. Before that, you really didn't know where you are. Yeah. So, so this is that. amazing, amazing story. So I'm I'm curious. One of the questions we like to ask about the initial phase is, what was the first name of the project? I mean, right now it's called Das Kapital, um, and it seems like that could be the only name. But I'm sure that that's not the first thing that you thought of. Actually, the, the titles, I really must say this is more, much more Timo's work. So we speak yes. about it. And yes. uh, this was really directly, we were almost, because we saw like the end in it, um, not even the end, but the transformation, the transformation of the world in which we live. And then why am I saying it was really interesting with the Corona time, because after this happened or during the time, we realized really that if something happens in one country, it's only a matter of time that it will reach you and it becomes a planetary project, a problem or project. Yeah. It's a, it is a project to save our lives somehow. It's also very yeah. weird how we say save the planet. It's not at all about saving the planet because the planet was before us and will continue. It's only about saving us. So it is our project. A collective project. And I think in this thing, Das Kapital epilogue, it was like these two things matched. It's a new realm in which we enter to today. Yeah. The virus, the pandemic just helped to accelerate or to make it visible for us. I guess the war, uh, which is yeah. not yet or maybe already a world war, we don't know, but there's something co collective in it. At least we see all the effects. Now the world realizes that uh, Ukraine was feeding the biggest part of the world so that people didn't know yeah. before. Do you feel with any of your works um, that, I mean, maybe this is a silly question to ask an artist, but I'm curious about it. Do you feel like these types of projects are projects that you personally, Nadia, need to create or that they just need to be created? Like somebody needs to make this point and I guess it's going to be me or no, 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 this is, I, this is, something inside me that needs to be said that is from me. Do you, do you see the difference? It's an excellent question. It's an yeah. excellent question. And because it's so good, I don't have a direct uh, answer, but I'm often asked, how do you get the ideas? And I don't look for them. They come to me. And I think there is something into it. There are things in the moment happening. And it's maybe not an, uh, a coincidence that several people think at similar things at the same time. So yeah. there are maybe 
frequencies, something happening, how we grow all together as humanity, as collective consciousness, and we uh, just connect to something, you know? It's as if it is in the air and I just get connect to something and that brings me the idea. So definitely I always feel that there is an urgency to do a work and I feel the relevance and the importance to do it. So I am carried with this conviction that it has to come out and that it is important for humanity. Not to change it, but to open up something, to bring some questions, to open a space in the heart or something like that. There's that belief, deep belief in, in me. Um, but at the same time, I think there is something collective into it. It's not only me. Produce. That's why I love working in context with people. I listen very much to what is happening. And I'm okay to feeling, okay, that was a wrong decision. So I was like, if someone gives me the right advice, I have no problem to follow. And I feel like it's really all part of the process. And yeah. I'm just being one member of all of it, you know. At the end, it's my name and all because this is the structure of the art world, how it is structured. But it always, it's always, every artwork is, a, for me, it's a collective work. Yeah. Sure. Um, if we think about the, the process of actually putting them together, one of the questions I love asking is what are some of the most instructive failures or turning points um, over the course of your career, maybe in these three projects, but over the course of your career, were there any sort of huge mistakes or very instructive mistakes or failures that you're like, oh my God, I learned so much about my work and my process going forward from that moment. I mean, one example that is what you just said, you know, turn the camera on and, and, and film don't, you know, don't embrace the embrace all the things you can't control and just go for it. Um, but were there other, uh, failures or missteps where, uh, you, uh, extracted some knowledge and wisdom? Yeah. Well, in all of them, I, I think that's the wisdom of life is, uh, you can never win if you don't lose. You can never stand if you don't fall. So that's like a matrix in my life. It's deep belief. And maybe one of my big mistakes is that I didn't embrace failure before. And this is maybe also my spiritual growth where I, I don't separate my spirituality from my work. So this is one of the big, big, big lessons. That's why I'm grateful for all the problems also in my childhood, all the heartbreaks, because they really opened up something that opened new perspectives. Uh, and in each work, there is that. So we can pick any of my works. There was a moment where something broke, something didn't work, and a blessing came out, came out of it. Um, in, the, in the case of uh, Das Kapitalia, yeah, that was clearly that moment. Uh, in the case of Flying Carpets, I remember that um, I made probably the mistake to you. It was an, uh, uh, on the level of material. I decided to go for aluminium because it's too, e too light, but actually aluminum is not the best material. It is too light. It's much better to use uh, stainless steel. And I chrome plated it, which was also not a good decision. So we replaced it. The, um, we did the second edition and the third edition, even the first edition we have changes. So that was like, I evolved. It's like doing learning by doing. And also everything, we tried, first of all, rigid threads, but then we saw that it didn't work, so we went for rubber threads, and then we realized that rubber thread is the only way to produce this very complex installation, because you have to build it step by step. And once it is so dense, you have to be able to move between the threads in order to continue to hang the last ones. And if they are not flexible, so this is something that's completely impossible to do. So it's always like by fa failure, you know, by mistake, yeah. you know how you go to the next step. And I think also in life, it is like that. Once you, you learn that lesson, you don't have to repeat it. You go to the next one. So. Yeah. Can you talk about, let's talk about flying carpets because of its sort of intricacy and complexity. Uh, on this screen, for those who are listening, there's um, many photos of the completed edition, but there's also a sketch. Um, how do you go from a concept to sketch to execution to installation um, what is that actual process like? How long does it take? For those of us who are not artists, we don't live in this world. Um, how does it? How does that work? Oh, really, very different from every from work to work because I am one of these artists who are not specialized in one technique in one medium, and it's rather the idea and like conceptual artist. So it's idea driven, but very close to the materiality. So the idea and the material and the medium they marry, they become one they make one body and it depends really from the context so this one 
the idea started, as I told you, from, I didn't even know that it would become idea. It was the moment where this event happened in Venice in 2009. But then it transformed into an idea for a project in 2010. And the re pro proper realization took like six to seven months. So there was the moment of the, it wasn't, I applied for the, this price because this is a very expensive and complicated process project to realize. This is why it's so interesting to have these kind of prices out there for artists in order to realize very ambitious and crazy projects that they wouldn't otherwise, have. like the production itself was around 85 to $90,000, just to yeah. tell you. So most of the price, the money of the price went for the production. Um, but then you realize the dream, you know, and you go from there. You have already a milestone, a step in your life. Um, so yeah, it was from the sketch and then there was my drawings and then we worked with 3D. Of course, we made everything uh, then AutoCAD in order to, to produce it. So it is a collective also project with engineers, with a, fa a company that produced this work, uh, with the several assistants who every thread is cut to a particular length it is super, super, really precise. So very complex. Where does where does Flying Carpets live today? So uh, in uh, in storages, it yeah. is part. Of the, <laughs> it's part of the picture that you were showing before. It's the Guggenheim collection, New York. This one is part yeah. of that. And it was shown in uh, uh, in the exhibition uh, curated by Sarah Raza in two thousand sixteen, I think. Um, but the storm is blowing because the time, anyways, that, yeah, yeah. And uh, the other collection is Jamil because it was part of the Abraj Capital Art Prize, and then it moved into the Jamil collection Dubai. And oh. it is part also of the Sharjah Art Foundation collection in Sharjah. Amazing, it's amazing. Um, okay, so let's talk but a little bit about paradise. <laughs> Do we say that again? And the title of the exhibition, But the Storm is Blowing from Paradise. But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise. Yeah. Okay, great. Then you um, quote. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question that is kind of um, pedestrian. If you're speaking to students, you know, 19-year-old, 18-year-old, uh, who want to become visual artists, conceptual artists, they, they're impressed by your work, they're inspired by your work. If you were just to give them very concrete tips for life as an artist, for doing similar work, you know, what are the tips? What are the pro tips that are very functional? Uh, similar works, I wouldn't say, because it's really irrelevant. Everyone will find- in A similar heart. type of work, I would say. Similar yeah, type. but no, I think most importantly, whatever work you do, it's not in whether it be painting, drawing, whatever, always, 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 this is like a golden rule. Believe in yourself. Deep, blind belief in yourself. Don't listen to what is told that you need to be empowered, that you need the help of I don't know who. We are the center of all of it in the art world. Because a lot of artists, especially when they graduate from art school, they believe if they don't have the right gallery, if they don't have the right support, they're not worth anything. It's the whole market and this whole thing wouldn't exist without us. There's a, so much misunderstanding and misinformation. And this also illusion about this um, marginal, dreamy artist that needs people to take care of their business. We can take care of our business, of our work. There's, if you can produce from out of nothing, something that can open hearts and blow minds and enter into history, you can definitely be also your own business, like entrepreneur and everything. So my advice, believe in yourself. Just do whatever your intuition is telling you. I love it. Okay, so um, let's talk about um, after, before we go to the quick Q&A. So after the projects are done, what is the experience afterwards? Do you just you know, uh, clap your hands <laughs> and move on? Or how does, how does the experience sort of live on after you're done with it? Uh, emotionally, how does it live on? The, yeah, for me, the after is really important. Um, mm -hmm. This is a good question because often in exhibitions, you have all of these informations in, around an artwork. So they tell you what the concept, even, you know, see, I say about myself, I'm a conceptual artist, but I usually don't like to have text next to my work. 
And when it is a solo exhibition, this is where I can more influence. But when it's a group exhibition, I cannot say much because there's a whole system for everyone. And I respect that, what the curator had in mind and everything. But I think it's a problem to have a text because once you have a text, you already told the viewer, it's like the identity. You name the thing and you excluded all the other possibilities. And why the after is important? Because I'm greedy to know and to understand my work through the lens of the others. And once you put the text, they took that away from me. It's like really on a very egoistic level. I grow with the people, you know, it's really for me an exchange. Yeah. And I see that the artist is this prophet telling you how to live and what to do at all. I learn as much as people probably hopefully learn from me. So that's why the after super important. I really go and listen to what people have to say. Sometimes I'm like, I don't even say that I'm the artist. We just enter into conversation. I'm super curious. And really many times I learned a lot about the work, about myself, about them, about the situation, about our time. They say, and especially if they are touched, and my work, you often told me, how would you speak to a student or 17 year old? Actually, the way I speak, I don't make an effort, it's natural. Small children connect to it. Uh, anyone can connect to it. And my work, most of the people who are touched by it, by the way, it is the people who don't come from the art world. Very often, like some people yeah. start, so people, the last work that I did in Lyon, that's like, I never thought that an artwork could do that. It's really forgetting that it's my work. It's people couldn't leave the space. There's something spiritual. There's so much vibration. I think it's this collective energy all over. And it, it is with the tree, it's with nature. So it was like the magic of nature and life that was there in that piece. And of course, I want to learn how people react and how they feel about it. I become like one of them. I forgot that. Yeah. It's, you know so the after is super important but for that it is important that you don't write text because you kill it if you do that yeah it's so all right here's another question are you trying to through your work all right is the end goal for you to try to understand i'll give you a couple options one for you to try to understand the world better two for you to change the world sort of bend bend uh uh people's perspective slightly or is it for you to be changed it's really uh, you're asking very good questions <laughs> it's all of them actually so uh i definitely understand the world better through my work so it is a personal and internal process uh with the exchange and everything Bending the world, um, it is a good term in me, bending, I think, but because it's not about changing, but my aim, if I at all have any, it's never political, but it's more about inspiring people to open a part of them that can ask many questions so that they don't take things for granted and really start to interact with their environment and to really feel like they, maybe to, uh, to give them the idea or the feeling that they can act upon the things that are around them. You know, it's not like get away from the idea of being victim. Nothing yeah. is, it is as long as you don't accept it. So my work, if at all, it bends in anything, it's more to inspire, give some kind of inspiration. And what was the third one? Sorry. I are you trying to understand yourself? No, that one I said, that was the first one. It is definitely. Um, oh, try have, having the people try to understand themselves, understand, you know, are you trying yeah. to create understanding? Banding, it's all together. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And um, uh, the, if I may, because I think smell is a very good example for the, the after. Maybe we yeah. can say a bit. So the idea of this work of smell was at that time, you know, if people know the, the, the flag of the Salafists, it's the Shahada, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, written on the black flag. And um, I wanted to represent that, but also for every Muslim, like this is the most important sentence. And there's so much blissfulness and beauty to it and all of it, we all like identify with it. So I wanted to write it, of course, for something that's also beautiful, the jasmine uh, with the smell and everything in respect to what it represents. But also there's this dangerous and the fear part because with the black, it symbolizes something else. It becomes political. It's not a spiritual 
sentence anymore. It becomes a political message. And the jasmine also brings us to this, in the beginning, the Tunisian revolution was called as jasmine revolution. And the idea was about a stolen revolution. You know, it was in the beginning, not religious at all. Really, there was no let Allahu Akbar uh, uh, cried or said. It was only about dignity, about uh, democracy. These were the movement of the youth. And then it was like as if it's a stolen revolution. So the idea was that the shahed is written with the jasmine. The first days you, sm- you see this, the smell. And the slowly, it's with the time it starts to fade away, and there's only dark um this uh, black that stays. And so in the museum, it is uh, the Carthage Museum in Tunis, archaeological actually museum, in which uh, at that time, Timo, my husband, made an in- exhibition of contemporary art with another curator, uh, Khadija Hamdi. Together they made this exhibition of contemporary art and my work was part of it. Anyways, so the guardian of the museum is Muhafid. His name is Hafid. And he, was, he openly says, I'm a Salafist. But this is the kind of Salafist, like I would have never said, because, you know, I have also all of my cliches and ideas of, you know, violent people, aggressive, they want you to think like them, because it's not like he's not saying I am a practical Muslim, I am Salafist. It means really something, you know, it's not an innocent term. But this was like such a peaceful guy in his corner, not uh, harming anyone, the opposite, Yani. And he really enjoyed very much the exhibition and the the archaeology have a lot of uh, sanam, you know, so it's like the sculptures, things that are in contradiction with his belief, supposedly. So one day I was just walking around and asking, so what is your favorite artwork? And he told me that one, my smell. I told him, did you understand what this work is about? He said, I did. I don't know. I understand it the way I understand it. That's the most sacred expression for me. And I love that it is represented with flowers. And yeah, I'm very attached to it. So uh, he said, do you know what's going to happen to it after the exhibition? I told him there are no plans, but yeah, it's my work. And he said, he asked me, can I have it? Can I keep it? I was like, sure, but you know, the flowers will fade away. So it's like, it is a processual work. It's not meant to stay. He said, don't worry. Every day I will be stitching a new jasmine and fill. I don't know if you know the fill. It's even also stronger, more beautiful smell. I was like so touched and I, of course, offered it to him. And I was like, you know, this guy who's supposedly Salafist, he is Salafist, calls himself, but not jihadist, so spiritual Salafist. And he's going to be restoring all of his life, a contemporary artwork. All of it is going to be, and it is for him a spiritual activity. So this piece, yeah, it's like a really big wow. For me, first of all, it's like, stop judging people. There is no whatever struck. You have been suffering from people putting you into boxes and now you did the same thing. And also it's like wh- how you mix belief and spirituality and contemporary art and actuality and politics. It was one of my biggest lessons of my life, actually, this conversation and offering this, giving him this offering. Wow. What a story. Yeah, it um. is. It's a really beautiful story. Um, Nadia, I want to end uh, with the final pr- uh, question, which is, what are you working on now? Oof. So I'm working on several projects. One of them is one of my dream, dream projects. So I started with this. Uh, I'm very attached to nature and to trees. And mm-hmm. I did the tree that I told you about in Guillaume, where I connected the, la- the death with life through tree. And I want to do another project with uh, really very painful about uh, tragic lives in Ukraine and with forest yeah. trees. So this is like a very, very deep, hard project for me. And in parallel, there is my uh, upcoming also very important project. Again, emo- they're all emotional, but everyone in their different ways. I'm going to produce another piece in Tunisia soon. I'm working on it now. Uh, so it's going to be about a region where I come from, my dad comes from, it's uh, Makfet, Maktaris, and where uh, there were massacres happening, um, like not killing, but injuring people. The Islamists did some terrible attack on population, especially young people. And this was the trigger, or let's say the beginning of the end, where we are today, the implosion of the parliament. So through this event, somehow I'm speaking about the recent 10 years of Tunisia history. Wow. So very 
excited also about this uh, monumental um, wall sculpture. Yeah, and many public artworks happening. So yeah, um, I mean, work is really like my work is, it's all very exciting. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Nadia, thanks so much for making the time to talk. I really, really do appreciate it, it was so a much. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, everyone, this will show up on the podcast tomorrow and up on YouTube and social media. Um, Nadia, thanks so much. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Take care.